Chak Surun Militang Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adwaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our study Bhakti Vai Bhav Srimad Bhagavatam and we are on Canto 3 and this morning we're beginning chapter number two. So who would like to tell us how did chapter one finish? What was the follow what happened at the end of chapter one? Anybody remember? Vidra wants to hear about Krishna Maharaj. Vidura wants to hear about Lord Krishna and who is he asking? Maitreya Rishi Maharaj. No, no. Uddhava, Uddhava, Uddhava Maharaj. Right. Uddhava. He has approached Uddhava. Mm -hmm. And he is asking Uddhava to tell him about Lord Krishna. He, had, he was asking about all different people from Dwarka. And then he was asking to hear about Lord Krishna. All right, so then the, third, the second chapter begins with a description of Uddhava. Uddhava is a very, very special devotee. He has very special characteristics. Uh, he's he's not an, an a conditioned soul, rather he's a nitya siddha. He's an eternally liberated soul, and he's a relative of Lord Krishna. He's born in the family. He's born in the Yadu dynasty there, connected one of Vasudev's wives, or Va one maybe it was it Vasudev's brother, it's the son of Vasudev's brother. Anyway, he's the relative of Lord Krishna and he has bodily features like Krishna. He's actually already achieved sa Swarupya Mukti because he has bodily features so that he resembles Lord Krishna. And we're told about his childhood. Right? Do you rem what was special about Uddhava's childhood? Yes, anybody know? He would uh, even play with the doll of Krishna. He would always be absorbed in uh, in serving Supreme Lord even in his childhood. Right. Even as a young child, he was playing with dolls of uh, Krishna. And Srimad Bhagavatam tells us that even when his mother would call him to come and take his food, he wouldn't be anxious to come and eat. You know, usually what... Usually... Well, even now, <laughs> you know, whenever there's food, you know, whenever our meals are ready, then we're ready to go and eat. And especially children, they like to, they enjoy the food. But 
when Devaki would, or when his mother would come with food or call him to come and take his meals, he would be so absorbed in playing with Lord Krishna in the form of the doll that he wouldn't be eager to go and eat. It said he was about five years old and he would play with the doll of Krishna who was also a child who was like five years old. And so in this way, he was having this friendly relationship with Lord Krishna. Uddhava's friendship relationship with Krishna, however, is not like the cowherd boys. Uddhava always thinks of Krishna as a superior. And we, you, we will see that when ever Uddhava goes with Lord Krishna and they're greeted and offered seats, Uddhava will never sit on the same level as Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna will take the seat and Uddhava will sit at his feet. So Uddhava always offered respects to Krishna, but at the same time he enjoyed some friendly relationship with Krishna. Uddhava was such a close friend of Krishna that Krishna would ask him, what, what do you think, Uddhava, what should we do? And of course, Uddhava was given a responsibility that after Krishna left Vrindavan and came to Mathura, Krishna sent Uddhava back to Vrindavan to deliver a message to the gopis. This is described, of course, in the 10th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, how Uddhava goes back to Vrindavan to bring the message of Lord Krishna to the gopis. And that message, Uddhava didn't give them the message, Uddhava read it to them. So Uddhava knows very well what was the message. Have any of you read this? Are you famili familiar with this pastime? Uddhava bringing a message to the gopis? What was Krishna's instruction to the gopis? Could you say that again, Prabhu? It wasn't clear. Paramatma everything. Alright. Yeah, Lord Krishna told in his message, he said, you know, you, you, can, you can never be separated from me. We're never separated. And Lord Krishna instructs the gopis to absorb themselves in remembering Lord Krishna and remembering all their pastimes with Lord Krishna and all the different things which they did together. And in this way, by cultivating the feeling of Lord Krishna in separation from Krishna, they will actually quickly go back to Godhead. So he was encouraging the gopis to cultivate this mood of uh, vipralamba seva or viraha, in the mood of viraha, separation and service in separation. So Uddhava had read this message to the gopis and Uddhava also followed that himself. That after Krishna had departed from the world, Uddhava followed the message which Krishna gave to the gopis and Uddhava also cultivated that mood of feeling the separation from Krishna and remembering Lord Krishna. And therefore, when Vidura came there and met with Uddhava, Uddhava was absorbed in trance. He was absorbed in remembering the pastimes of Lord Krishna. So Vidura had asked the questions to Uddhava and these questions 
caused him to again remember Lord Krishna. So it increased the ecstasy of Uddhava. He became, he, he was in, in ecstasy. We're, we're told in the Srimad Bhagavatam how there were different ecstatic symptoms in the body of Uddhava. Right? Can you think, what are some of these ecstatic symptoms which Uddhava was experiencing? Tears came through. Tears, yes. Hair standing. Yeah, the standing, bodily hairs erect, standing on end. And like that. Shivering. Shivering. And, sorry? Shivering, Maharaj. Shivering or trembling, yes. These are all different symptoms of ecstasy or bhava and prema, which are awakened by remembrance of Lord Krishna. So we can understand some of, something of the, the characteristics of Anicca Siddha devotee by hearing about Uddhava. What is the particular nature of Anicca Siddha devotee? He's aloof from this material world, Maharaj. Yes. He's bothered about the material external conditions. Yes. Thinks everyone to be better than himself. Sorry? He thinks, every, he thinks everyone else to be better than himself. Oh. He's very humble, considers himself fallen. Yes, Uddhava considered himself unfortunate. In what way did Uddhava think himself unfortunate? Lord, uh, everyone Lord left, left me here like that, he may be thinking, Maharaj. Sorry? Lord took back everyone to Golok Vrindavan, but he left me here like that, he may be... Yes, that's one thing. Yeah, everybody got back to Godhead. All the soldiers on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, they got liberation, and the Yadus got annihilated. They went back to Godhead. And the Kurus also, they've all gone, they're also liberated, but Uddhava is still there in the material world, so he's, he's unfortunate. Uddhava also thinks himself unfortunate in the sense that he had the association of Lord Krishna, but he did not take full advantage of that association of Lord Krishna. Just like Vasudev, that's, that's described in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, how Vasudev, Lord Krishna's father, after Lord Krishna departed from the world, then Vasudev regretted that he'd never taken advantage of having Lord Krishna as his son. And, and he thought himself also to be very foolish that he asked for the benediction of having the Lord as his son. He should have thought about getting out of the world, going back to Godhead, but he simply thought only to ask the benediction that the Lord would come as his son. So he regretted that. So similarly, Uddhava, he was thinking himself unfortunate that he'd never taken full advantage to really serve, to give his full service to Lord, Lord Krishna, although he recognized Lord Krishna as the personality of Godhead. So Anicca Siddha devotee, they never forget Krishna. That is the, the point, that they never forget Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada also told us, he said, I never, I never forgot Krishna. And we see parallels in the life of Srila Prabhupada, 
how he was born in a devotee family. And as a young child, he would see his father worshipping the deity. And he would also do some kind of worship. And he would have, we heard about how he would, as a child, he would do Rathi Atra. And all the children would come together and they would celebrate Rathi Atra together. So this was Prabhupada's childhood. And then his father also had him learn to play the Madanga. And Srila Prabhupada was also expert harmonium player. He said his, his harmonium playing was so pleasing. He said there were, there were young women wanted to marry him simply because of his harmonium playing. <laughs> Interesting. So, anyway, Prabhupada had that from his childhood, that he was brought up in a Vaishnava family. And he said, just like his own spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, of course, he is the seminal son of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So he was also brought up in the Vaishnava family, he was born in Jagannath Puri, a holy place, and he would see the Rathiatra, and as a child he was placed at the feet of Lord Jagannath and blessed with the garland from Lord Jagannath. And he was, his father would, we're, we're told also his father was offering mangoes one day and when he took mangoes, his father told him, oh you took before the offering, that was not good. And so from that time on, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati never ate mangoes. And whenever he was offered mango fruits, he would say, no, I cannot take, I am an offender. And so this is the childhood of Nichasiddha devotees, that from the beginning of their life, they're in Krishna consciousness. And so we see from Bhagavad Gita that yogis who are somewhat advanced but maybe not completely perfect, that they would take birth in the family of devotees. But here we see Uddhava, you can see his Nityasiddha, he's perfect. And Srila Prabhupada also shows similar characteristics that just as Uddhava would feel ecstasy in remembering Lord Krishna, Srila Prabhupada would sometimes also feel ecstasy. He would be absorbed in trance. There were different occasions which are noted by devotees. There was one occasion in San Francisco, in the very beginning of our movement, when a devotee asked the question about Lord Chaitanya and how Lord Chaitanya is sometimes crying and sometimes he will throw, he will go into the sea. And he, they asked Prabhupada to explain this. And when Prabhupada began to explain it, at one point he went into a, a trance for a few minutes. And the devotees could feel the very special silence which was there at that time. And Prabhupada's eyes were filled with tears as he thought about the pastime of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then there was another time it happened in Gorakhpur, Gorakhpur in North India. And Prabhupada had gone there and he was teaching the devotees the song Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari. So Prabhupada was just introducing this song to the devotees and he taught them one couple of days and he explained the meaning and everything to them. Then the third day when he was talking about it and explaining a little, at that point he went into a trance 
and he was in a trance for several minutes. And when he returned to external consciousness, then his eyes were filled with tears. So there, there are some instances where the devotees could actually see Prabhupada entering into trance. But generally, the devotee will not exhibit these symptoms in the presence of others. When it actually happens, even if somebody does feel that kind of ecstasy, then they should go out of the temple and they should go to a private place. But you don't want to display these kind of symptoms in the public. It's not the Vaishnava behavior. So Prabhupada was also conscious of that. And as much as possible, he would suppress it and control it. We see Uddhava meeting with Vidura. It's a private place. There's just the two of them. There's no other people there. They're meeting in some lonely place. So Uddhava was in transcendental consciousness. Prabhupada describes that the pure devotees, they, they actually are not in this material world. They actually go to the abode of the Lord and they're there with the Lord in his own abode in the spiritual world. But they return to this world, they come back to this world, to external consciousness in order to facilitate the Lord's mission here in this world. So we see Uddhava in his trance, in his ecstasy, and Vidura is approaching him with questions. So the Lord actually tells Uddhava, go back, you have to answer Vidura's questions, <laughs> right? Uddhava, had, he was in the abode of the Lord internally. He, although his body was th there in the material world, in this world, he was spiritually in the, in the abode of the Lord. But the Lord told him, you go back, you have to answer Vidura's questions. So Vidura comes back to the world and he's ready to reply to the questions of Vidura. All right, so let's look at the text here. Maybe we'll share the text. The first few chapters, the first few verses rather, of this chapter are all describing the transcendental characteristics of Uddhava. We'll just read the translations. Sri Shukadev Goswami said, When the great devotee Uddhava was asked by Vidura to speak on the message of the dearest Lord Krishna, Uddhava was unable to answer immediately due to excessive anxiety at the remembrance of the Lord. So this anxiety, we should understand, this is not material anxiety, of course. This is transcendental anxiety. And remembering the Lord, he would remember that the Lord has uh, left this world, gone away from the... So Vidura would feel the separation from the Lord. Going ahead, text number two. He was one who even in his childhood, at the age of five years, was so absorbed in the service of Lord Krishna that when he was called by his mother for morning breakfast, he did not wish to have it. So there's really a very nice thing to do to take care of the children, our children in the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Prabhupada was very concerned 
about the children in our Krishna consciousness movement because he knew that these children, they're the future of our Krishna consciousness movement and particularly children born to devotees, they're very special souls because they, they must have very, very good karma to take birth in the womb of a devotee, in the family of a devotee. And being born in the family of devotee means from the beginning of their life, they have that opportunity to be Krishna conscious. So Prabhupada said that it would take our movement a few generations to get pure souls. But Prabhupada was confident that in the future there will be pure devotees appearing in the Krishna consciousness movement who will take up this Krishna consciousness mission and preach it all over the world. Going ahead, text number three, Uddhavada served the Lord continually from childhood and in his old age that, that attitude of service never slackened. As soon as he was asked about the message of the Lord, he at once remembered all about him. This is another important point that in old age people think, oh, now I'm old, I want to retire, I want to stop. But the nature of devotional service is, it simply increases. Srila Prabhupada remarks in one purport that old age and disease are an impetus for devotional service. They make us more serious about devotional service because we can understand we're getting close. The time's coming close where we're going to have to give up the material body and we have to become very serious and very absorbed in Krishna, right? The time of leaving the body, that's like the, the final exam. So for the final exam, you make great efforts to prepare for the exam to know everything well so that you can do well in the exam. So our final examination comes at the end of life. We don't want to fail that exam because if we fail that exam, it means we come back again in this material world. It means we may even take a lower birth or lo lose the association of devotees. So we want to take full advantage of our Krishna consciousness. We saw in Srila Prabhupada also how Srila Prabhupada became so intense in the final years of his life in this world. How he was pushing the devotees to do more and more, open more and more temples and Prabhupada himself was translating so much and he pushed the devotees to print all the books, get everything printed the whole Chaitanya Charitamrita and so many volumes of Srimad Bhagavatam. How hard Prabhupada was working, pushing on the Krishna consciousness movement, just to get it all set up so that in the future it could go on. So old age doesn't mean retirement, but it, it means taking up more service for Krishna. And Uddhava was like that. Although Uddhava said certainly he, his body must have aged, but he, his service increased and expanded with passing of time. Going ahead, text number four. For a moment he remained dead, silent, and his body did not move. He became absorbed in the nectar of remembering the Lord's lotus feet in devotional ecstasy, and he appeared to be going increasingly deeper into that ecstasy. So this is 
Prabhupada talks about how the devotee actually goes to the abode of the Lord, that the consciousness, although, although the body may be physically here in this world, but his consciousness is not. Just like Srila Prabhupada would be in America, and he would tell the devotees, he'd say, I'm not in New York, I'm always in Vrindavan, because I'm always thinking of Krishna. So always thinking of Krishna, that, that is the sign of the pure devotee, the nature siddhas. They never forget Krishna. And al although they may appear to be in the material world, they're not thinking of this material world, but they're absorbed in thought of Lord Krishna. Just like some of the associates of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they were always, when people would talk to them, they would always be in thinking about Vrindavan and about how much is the milk? How, no. Oh, you have to go to Govardhan? And they were somewhere else, but they would be talking about Vrindavan and they'd be in the mood of cowherd boys and talking about the cows and the yogurt and the milk. But actually they were in some other place. They were over in Bengal and in, in, in Navadweep. And, but their consciousness was just simply in Vrindavan, in Krishna Leela. So like the devotees, in the, those pure devotees, they go deep, deep into remembrance of Lord Krishna, remembering all of his different pastimes and activities, thinking about his wonderful qualities. And we read about Uddhava also, how Uddhava was so absorbed in thinking about Lord Krishna's wonderful qualities, how Lord Krishna was so humble, coming before his mother and father and apologizing to them that I could not serve you properly. So, and then Lord Krishna is sweet, smiling at everyone and pleasing everyone. So Uddhava was absorbed in remembering all of these different things. Although he appears to be silent, it's not that his mind is blank. We see that the impersonalists, the jnanis, the yogis, these people, they, want, they make the mind blank. But the devotee fills his mind with thoughts of Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna's qualities. Okay, going ahead, text number five. It was so observed by Vidura that Uddhava had all the transcendental bodily changes due to total ecstasy, and he was trying to wipe away tears of separation from his eyes. Thus Vidura could understand that Uddhava had completely assimilated extensive love for the Lord. Well, this is the goal of life, to develop love of God. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would say, Prem Punarto Mahan. The goal of life is to develop love of God. Uddhava had achieved this love. And Prem, you can even, Uddhava went even higher than Prema. The next stage after Prema is even more intense, Sneha where Uddhava becomes more deeply absorbed in thought of the Lord. So how to get to that stage of prema? We have to go through the different stages of devotional service. We have to follow, first of all, the devotional service in practice according to the rules and regulations, right? And go through Anartha nivriti, get rid of all the dirty things in the heart, purify our hearts, develop some uh, steadiness in the practice of devotion, nishta, and then ruchi, developing taste for these different activities, developing the taste for the holy name and for seeing the deities, serving the deities taste for hearing Srimad-Bhagavatam, 
And then we have to, from there, asakti, the detachment from all material things. And then comes bhava, which is the first ray of the awakening of prema, of love of God. And from bhava then comes prema, the full awakening of love of God. And so this is the, the process of bhakti yoga. We have to go through these different stages. You want to get love of God, we have to follow the process. Because some people may be fortunate, they may get very quickly, they may experience ecstasies, but sometimes it's shadow ecstasy. We have to see how long they can maintain. We're told about Uddhava, his whole life was devotion to Krishna. And Prabhupada told us, he said, throughout my life I never forgot Krishna. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, throughout his life he was devotee. So this is the nature of the pure devotees, that they never give up Krishna consciousness, they never go away from Krishna consciousness. Some people, they, they, they feel some ecstasy, one minute, next minute they're outside and they're away in the material world again, absorbed in some maya. So there has to be that steadiness of devotion. All right? Text number six. The great devotee Uddhava Soon, soon came back from the abode of the Lord to the human plane, and wiping his eyes, he awakened his reminiscence of the past and spoke to Vidura in a pleasing mood. So we hear about Uddhava, how he wanted to speak to Vidura. And Prabhupada says here, he said, you can see here, he, he came down from the abode of the Lord, Dwarka, to the material plane of human being. Right? Urva came down to the, the abode of, from the abode of the Lord, Dwarka. So Uddhava, although Uddhava had gone to Vrindavan, he was not on the level of the Vrajbasis. He's a Dwarkavasi. Uddhava's in Dwarka Lila with Lord Krishna. But of course Uddhava has the greatest respect for the gopis of Vrindavan because he had gone there and he'd seen them. And he desired, Uddhava desired that he could become a creeper or a plant in Vrindavan and somehow get the dust from the feet of the gopis. All right, are there any questions on this so far? We're hearing about the exalted character of Uddhava. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Is uh, understood that Uddhava learned uh, spiritual subjects from uh, Brahaspati. So, how he learned and when he learned, Prabhuji? And uh, my second, yes, Prabhuji. And my second question is: uh, So, did Uddhava learn uh, Srimad Bhagavatam also from uh, uh, Brahaspati? Because Brahaspati learned from Shankar and Muni uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. And my third question is: uh, uh, When uh, uh, Vidura met uh, Uddhava immediately after the departure of Krishna or after how many years? Because Lord Krishna gave instruction to uh, Uddhava to go to Badri. Uh, but uh, whether he was still staying at uh, that uh, Dwarka area uh, uh, or what, when he exactly learned, uh, met, uh, Maitreya met, uh, sorry, uh, um, Vidura met uh, uh, Uddhava Prabhuji. Uh, sorry, Maharaj. Yeah, but I don't. I don't know these, I've never seen this information anywhere. I've often wondered myself how it is that 
Uddhava could be a disciple of Brihaspati, when Brihaspati is a guru of the demigods, that how did, how it is, how it happens that <laughs> Uddhava became his disciple. I, I wondered about this myself. I never saw any information and I never heard from anyone exactly how it happens. There may be some reference somewhere. Usually I think of Brihaspati being in the heavenly planets. So how is it that Uddhava could be his disciple? I don't know the answers to these questions, you know. I, I've never seen this information anywhere. If you find out, you please tell me. <laughs> I'd like to know. But I do know that certainly Lord Krishna has departed from the world. And this is described, this coming up text number 7, Uddhava is going to describe to Vidura that Lord Krishna has left the world. So their meeting took place after Lord Krishna's departure. And uh, how many years did it happen? Well, we know that Vidura was traveling in the holy places for some 30 to 35 years. We don't have a lot of information on chronology in relation to all these things, but you know, we, we know that they met after Lord Krishna had departed, exactly how long it was. We're told they met somewhere at Gurgong, was it? In Gurgong it was mentioned, the district of Gurgong, that Uddhava met Vidura. And there's also that one temple there at Govardhan, which was Uddhava's, Uddhava's temple there. And I, there's a temple there at the side of Govardhan. As you come around Govardhan, just before you get up to Radha Kund, and there's a nice temple there. Uddhava Kund is there. And it said Uddhava used to sit there and meditate. Now, I'm not sure. Kusum huh? Kusum Kusum no, no, not Kusum Sarova. Just the Kuta. Just behind Kusum Sarova, you have the Buddha. A temple, Maharaj, where uh, he has tripa, where he gave the Bhagavatam class to the queens, Maharaj. That's what is mentioned. Uh, yeah, but when you come around, you know, you come, go around Govardhan, and you come around, and before you get up to Radha Kund, there's one temple there. It's Uddhava, there's a Kund there, Uddhava Kund. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Anyway, I, I don't, I'm not an, so expert in all these holy places in Braja. Uh, I need to spend more time there in Vrindavan to be able to tell you more about this, but we do know that Uddhava met Vidura. And it was mentioned that they were meeting somewhere like Gurgong. Uh, Harikshna Maharaj? Yes? Uh, do we have any information about uh, who Uddhava was in his previous Janma? Yes, it's mentioned in one place, it was mentioned that he was one of the Vasus. One of the Vasus. If he's a uh, Nitya Siddha, then. Uh, he would be uh, always there, be there with the Lord, right? So... Yes, right. This is why, yeah, difficult to understand that he's, he's eternally in the spiritual world with the Lord as Uddhava. But some, in some places it says Uddhava comes as, he was one of the Vasus in previous life. So it's possible that he, he t before coming to the earthly planet, that he took birth in the heavenly planets as one of the Vasus. But he, and, and Maharaj, one more question. Um, if he was a Nitya Siddha, why did he have to learn about bhakti from the gopis? Because Nitya Siddhas are on different levels. You see, he's a resident of Dwarka. He's not a resident of Vrindavan. 
is not a is not one is not living in Vrindavan. He is a Dwarkavasi. So the mood in Dwarka is different from the mood in Vrindavan. But Nichasiddhas can be on all different levels. You see, it's not that he has to be in the mood of the gopis to be Nichasiddha. There are Nichasiddhas also in Dwarka. There are Nichasiddhas also in Mathura. They don't have the mood of the gopis. We want to understand the difference between the devotional service practiced in Vrindavan and Braja and that practiced in Dwarka. That will be discussed. But first of all, Uddhava is replying to Vidura's questions. And let's look here, text number seven. Uddhava said, My dear Vidura, the son of the world, Lord Krishna, has said, and our, uh, and our house has now been swallowed by the great snake of time. What can I say to you about our welfare? So this is a, the verse which describes that Lord Krishna has departed from the world. The disappearance of Lord Krishna is described here in this way by Uddhava, that he compares the, disappear the departure of Lord Krishna from the world is compared to the setting of the sun. Lord Krishna's appearance is like the sunrise. So the sun rises in Mathura and the sun set over at Prabhashitra when the Lord departed from the world. Uh, the Lord appears, stay, just like the sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening, but it's not that the sun is finished. The sun is just no longer visible to us. And so in the same way, when the Lord leaves the world, it's not that the Lord has finished that he's dead or anything, but he's just no longer visible to us. So this is the point, this example, this comparison to the sun rising and setting is used to compare to the appearance and the disappearance of Lord Krishna. The sun rises here in India and it, at that time it may be setting in America. So the same way Lord Krishna is appearing one place and he may be disappearing in another place. But the pastimes of Lord Krishna go on eternally. It's not like they're, they're you know, they're finished. The Lord's appearance is eternal. He has a spiritual body. So he's not subject to any of the miseries of any of the problems of the material body. Of course, with the departure of Lord Krishna, we feel the loss of Lord Krishna. We feel his absence. And it's described here that in the absence of Lord Krishna, then those people who are irreligious, they become happy. And the dacoits and thieves, they become happy in the darkness. They can go and do their crimes. So those people who have no love for the Lord, they become happy when they see Lord Krishna leave the world. But so long as Lord Krishna is present, then that's like the presence of the sun. In the presence of the sunlight, then there's some security, there's safety, there's no anxiety. But when the sun sets, then the anxiety comes about. So how many times does the Lord Krishna come into this world? How many times does the Lord come and perform his pastimes? It is described here that the Lord 
his pastimes take place just one time in the day of Brahma. Just like the sun rises one time in the day and it sets one time in the day. So in the same way, Lord Krishna's pastimes take place once in the day of Brahma. And the day of Brahma, Sahasra Yuga Paryantam Aharyam Brahmano Vidu. So 4,300 million years is one day of Brahma. And the Lord comes into this world just one time. So it's very, very special when the Lord comes. And He comes into this world and He performs His pastimes, particularly to give pleasure to his devotees, and then he leaves the world. Prabhupada writes, just to read the last paragraph here, As at sunset, the snakes become powerful, thieves are encouraged, ghosts become active, the lotus becomes disfigured, and the Chakravati laments. So with the disappearance of Lord Krishna, the atheists feel enlivened and the devotees become sorry. Okay, so this is Uddhava's description of the disappearance of the Lord. And then Uddhava goes on to speak more about how the members of the Yadu dynasty, how they relate to the Lord. Text number eight. This universe with all its planets is most unfortunate. And even more unfortunate are the members of the Yadu dynasty because they could not identify Lord Hari as a personality of Godhead any more than the fish could identify the moon. So the, 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 the scriptures describe how the moon was churned from the ocean of milk. So the moon appears from the ocean of milk. So the fish, they could think that the moon is just another fish. And this example is given to the Yadu dynasty, that the members of the Yadu dynasty, that they could not properly identify Lord Krishna, Lord Hari. They couldn't identify him as the personality of Godhead. There's a story about this, the moon coming from the ocean of milk. In the beginning of the movement, uh, there was one lady devotee. So she was, she's a scholarly devotee. Uh, she's still a devotee. Uh, she, she asked Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, what does it mean? The moon was churned from the ocean of milk. And so Prabhupada said to her, say it again, the moon was churned from the ocean of milk. And so then Prabhupada says to her, yes, say it one more time. The moon was churned from the ocean of milk. Then Prabhupada looked at her and said, now do you understand? And she said, yes, Prabhupada, the moon was churned from the ocean of milk. And Prabhupada said to her, yes. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes some of these statements are difficult to understand. We just have to take them for what they are. So, the, the, anyway, it's an example which is given comparing the Lord. The, these, the members of the Yadu dynasty, they couldn't properly understand the Lord. They thought he's just... Somebody else, you know, another person, you know, they, they thought may, he's a super soul, of course. They think of him as a super soul. But 
the Lord is not an ordinary person. This is their limited thinking. So Vidura is hearing from Uddhava. Uddhava gives this example about the fish in the ocean or the fish coming from the ocean of milk, the, the moon coming from the ocean of milk and the fish think the moon is just another fish. And so the same way the members of the Yadu dynasty, they don't properly understand Lord Krishna. So this is the same point which comes up again, text number nine, more about the Yadus, that they were they were all experienced devotees, learned and expert in psychic study. Over and above this, they were always with the Lord in all kinds of relaxations. And still, they were only able to know Him as the one Supreme who dwells everywhere. So they know him. How do the Yadus know him? They, they know him as the one supreme who dwells everywhere. In other words, they know him as the super soul. They don't know him as the Swayam Bhagavan, but they know him as the, the super soul, the Lord who dwells everywhere. Vidura, uh, he wants to know all of these things, he wants to understand what is the relationship here between these different devotees. So Prabhupada gives us a little information. He says here, talking about in Vrindavan, he said in Vrindavan, however, because in the Yadus, he said, first of all, before that, he said, this lack of knowledge was not due to their insufficient erudition. It was due to their misfortune. The Yadus were unfortunate. It was their misfortune that they didn't know Krishna. But then Prabhupada talks about in Vrindavan. In Vrindavan, however, the Lord was not even known as the Paramatma because the residents of Vrindavan were pure, unconventional devotees of the Lord and could think of Him only as their object of love. So we may be thinking that, oh, these Yadus, how could they be great, great devotees? They think of Krishna just as a super soul. But Prabhupada said, well, in Vrindavan, the people in Vrindavan, they don't even think of Krishna as the super soul. They just think of, they just love Krishna. They think of him as the son of Nanda Maharaj and they love him. That is pure love. We have to understand what is the meaning of this pure love. It's not just thinking of God, seeing him as God. But it's the object of love. Prabhupada continues, they did not know that he is the personality of Godhead. The Yadus or the residents of Dwarka, however, could know Lord Krishna as Vasudev or the super soul living everywhere, but not as the Supreme Lord. At the end, the Yadus therefore accepted Lord Krishna as the super soul incarnated in their family, but not more than that. That that is again that's their love for Krishna. They see Krishna like they see him as the super soul. They don't see him as the supreme personality of Godhead, Swayam Bhagavan. They see him as the super soul. But that's their misfortune. They were, they're very experienced devotees, learned, expert in psychic study. 
and always with the Lord in all kinds of relations, of all kinds of relaxation. So they enjoyed so much association with the Lord. They were able to be so close with Him. But at the same time, they respected Him. He was their master. He was their leader. Going ahead, text number 10. Under the circumstances, can the words of persons bewildered by the illusory energy of the Lord deviate the intelligence of those who are completely surrendered souls. Uddhava is speaking. He is telling Vidura that those people who are surrendered souls, they will not be bewildered. They will not be disturbed by these things. Persons who are bewildered by the illusory energy of the Lord. And there are people, of course, there are many people who are bewildered by the illusory energy of the Lord. And Prabhupada in his purport, he gives some examples, right? Those of you who have read the purports, you will know some of the examples Prabhupada talks about. Yes? What do they say about Lord Krishna, for example? They say Lord Krishna, oh, described here, uh, according to the atheist here, up here, According to the atheist, according to the atheist point of view, Lord Krishna's family, the Yadu dynasty, was vanquished due to being cursed by the Brahmanas for the sins committed by Krishna in killing the sons of Dhritarashtra, etc. All these Blasphemy, blasphemies do not touch the heart of the devotees of the Lord because they know perfectly well what is what. Their intelligence regarding the Lord is never disturbed. But those who are disturbed in the statements of the Asuras are also condemned. That is what Uddhava meant in this verse. Can you understand the point made here? Pe these people who are affected by the illusory energy, they think that Lord Krishna was an ordinary person and they blame him. Just like people write things like people write commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita and they condemn Lord Krishna. They say Lord Krishna was wrong that Krishna, he encouraged this battle of Kurukshetra and all these people died. He shouldn't have done that. They don't understand anything about the position of Lord Krishna and his speaking of Bhagavad Gita. But they dare to write commentaries and to comment on the Bhagavad Gita. This is their maya. This is their ignorance. So people say so many things. We have to know who to hear from and not to be bewildered by the words of all of these atheistic people. And of course another thing which they talk about is the disappearance of Lord Krishna. They say Lord Krishna was killed by a hunter. And they will say, there's even the ashes of Lord Krishna, the ashes of his body are there. You can see the grave where Krishna's ashes are. They will talk like that. So they think Lord Krishna was an ordinary person. He did something sinful and he died, he got killed. 
And all, the, all of his associates, they all got killed, they all got the karma for his sins. And they talk all of this nonsense. So we should not be disturbed by it. We should know who to hear from. So it's very clearly explained here by Uddhava, the position of Lord Krishna. Okay. Mentioned here, the Yadavas were only partially cognizant of the Lord, but they are also glorious because they had the opportunity to associate with the Lord, who acted as the head of their family, and they also rendered the Lord intimate service. And then Prabhupada talks about those who think of Krishna as being an ordinary person. He said, they are hellish and are envious of the Supreme Lord. Such persons are faithless and are infected by the mentality of atheism. They are always very eager to establish that Lord Krishna was an ordinary man who was killed by a hunter due to many impious acts in plotting to kill the sons of Dhritarashtra and Jarasandha. So Prabhupada refutes these different arguments of people with the statements of Srimad Bhagavatam. In this case, Uddhava is speaking and describing about Lord Krishna. He's warn Uddhava is warning us that the intelligence of those who are completely surrendered souls will not be bewildered by the illusory energy. We should be careful. Okay, going ahead. Text number 11. Lord Sri Krishna, who manifested his eternal form for, before the vision of all on the earth, performed his disappearance by removing his form from the sight of those who were unable to see him as he is due to his executing required penance. So this is a, a very important verse because this verse factually states that Lord Krishna departed from the world. He, he took his spiritual body, his spiritual body departed with him. So, what was the body that was remaining? What body did they burn? How can they claim they have ashes there? We have to understand this was the Maya Krishna. Just as in Ramayana, we have Ravana supposed to be taking Mother Sita. But what Sita did he actually take? He didn't take the real Sita. He took a Maya Sita. A demon like Ravan could never touch his, put a hand on M Mother, Mother uh, Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. The, she's the eternal consort of the Lord. Ravan took a Maya Sita, not the real, the pure Sita. The pure Sita just became unmanifest. And similarly with Lord Krishna, when it came time for Lord Krishna to depart from the world, he left a body, a Maya Krishna, not his own transcendental form. His own transcendental form became avyakta, became unmanifest. Does everyone understand this? This is often bewildering to ordinary people. They don't know the nature of Lord Krishna's disappearance from the world. And they think he was killed. 
by the hunter Jara, who got that piece of metal, ground it to an arrowhead and used it to pierce the foot of Lord Krishna. But this was the pastime which was enacted by Lord Krishna so that he could depart from the world. And he left a maya form, not his own transcendental form. When he departed from the world, he, his transcendental form became unmanifested. Okay, so uh, mentioned here in Prabhupada's purport, the Lord, by His unlimited costless mercy, has innumerable Vaikuntha planets in the Brahmajyoti sphere of the spiritual world. And in that transcendental world, there is an unlimited arrangement for the unlimited pleasures of the living entities. We want to understand that if we want enjoyment, we will get enjoyment in the spiritual world. We will not get enjoyment here in this world. This is the material world. There's no enjoyment here. If we want enjoyment, you have to go back to Godhead. You have to be with the Lord. You have to go to His abode. And there you can enjoy unlimited. So then Prabhupada's purport goes on to speak about the, the places of the Lord's pastimes like Vrindavan, Mathura and Dwarka. And the mission of the Lord, he appears to attract the conditioned souls back to Godhead. Krishna comes to attract us by performing his pastimes for the pleasure of his devotees and to attract the conditioned souls to take up devotional service. Prabhupada explains that the purpose of the Vedic way is to encourage people on the path of piety. Because of sinful reactions, because of our past sins, we're not able to see the Lord. But if we become pious, if we start to control the mind and senses and follow the different principles of civilized life, then we can become elevated to the higher consciousness. And then we can become eligible to take up devotional service. So Prabhupada talks about when Krishna was present on the planet, there were many people, they were not able to understand him. They were not able to appreciate him because they had no piety, because they were so sinful. And so the, they, they just remain attached to the material world. Prabhupada writes, when the Lord passed beyond the vision of all, he did so in his original eternal form, as stated in this verse. The Lord left in his own body. He did not leave his body, as is generally misunderstood by the conditioned souls. This statement defeats a false propaganda of the faithless non-devotees, that the Lord passed away like an ordinary conditioned soul. The Lord appeared in order to release the world from the undue burden of the non-believing Asuras. And after doing this, he disappeared from the world's eyes. So Lord Krishna comes into this world with a mission. 
Bino Parijanaya Sadunam Vines Chaya Chajuskrita Dharma Samstarpa Nartaya Sambhavami Yogi This is the Lord's mission. And when the Lord's mission is completed, then he departs from the world. How, how does he do it? Lord, the Lord said, Ajopisana Vyadyatma Bhutana Mishvaropisam. Although I'm unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates, I still appear in every millennium. So the appearance of Lord Krishna is very bewildering for atheistic non-devotees. People who are sinful will have great difficulty to understand the pastimes of Lord Krishna. But if we hear, if we are willing to hear carefully, submissively, and to take to the process of bhakti yoga, then we can become fortunate, we can begin to understand. Prabhupada wrote the Krishna book describing the pastimes of Lord Krishna and he describes this book will be good for three kinds of people. He mentions three kinds of people. He said it will be good for those who, who are pure devotees. Those who are pure devotees, they will take pleasure in hearing the pastimes of Lord Krishna. He said it will be good for those who are aspiring to become devotees to become devotional. It will help them to awaken their Krishna consciousness. And he said it will be good even for the mundaners who are on the bodily platform. He said there's all kinds of wonderful pastimes that are described there within the Krishna book. They can read about romance, they can read love stories, they can read crime stories, war stories, so many different leelas are there, the Lord's pastimes. The Lord performs all different kinds of pastimes for the pleasure of his devotees. Those who are his devotees, they will be attracted, they want to hear these pastimes more and more. And we know by understanding the Lord's pastimes, we become qualified to go back to Godhead. Janma karma cha me devyam evam yo veti takpada. We have to understand the janma and the karma of Lord Krishna, that it is all transcendental. It's not of this material world. So text number 11 is the, the verse describing how Lord Krishna doesn't leave a body. He, he, his own body is eternal spiritual body. He, Lord Krishna doesn't have any karma. Sometimes people, you see all of them, they're talking about Krishna's karma, that he, he did sins and he killed, the, he was responsible for the death of Dhritarashtra's sons and, you know, and they're, they're giving Krishna karma. But Krishna doesn't have any karma. He doesn't get, he himself is the controller of the material nature. Right? Material nature is under his control. And so he doesn't have any karma. Fourth chapter, text number 14. Lord Krishna said that there is no work that affects me, and nor do I desire the fruits of any action. Namam karmani limpanti. There is no work that affects me. So you can't say Lord Krishna has any karma. This is their misunderstanding. So we have to present these things to people. There's so much ignorance about the pastimes of Lord Krishna. And we have to explain these things on the basis of scriptures like Srimad Bhagavatam. Are there any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Yes, uh, Maharaj, can you just a little bit again explain? Because in that ninth verse, so Yadus were uh, told like misfortune also. And uh, ninth is like next page. 
Yes, ninth verse. Next page, purple. Uh huh. In the purple. Yes, yes, ma'am. So here, uh, before before uh, this uh, headline, before this, uh, it was due to their misfortune. Due to their misfortune, yeah. This lack of knowledge was not due to the insufficient erudition. It was due to their misfortune, <laughs> right? So Prabhupada is describing the yadus like that. They're they're unfortunate. It it wasn't due to the lack of education or the lack of erudition. They studied. They were well, well educated. They were in good knowledge and everything, but it wasn't their good fortune to be uh, to be in that to be in this in a different rasa with Krishna. According to the situation, you know, they were in Dwarka. So the mood in Dwarka was like that. So it, the mood in Dwarka was different from the mood in Vrindavan. But Prabhupada said even in Vrindavan, the people in Vrindavan, they don't think of Krishna as God. But they have that, they have the higher love for, for Krishna. The difference between Dwarka and Vrindavan, uh, we read more about it from Gorgovinda Maharaj. He talked about it a lot. He talked about how in Vrindavan there's the sweetness of pure love, but in Dwarka there's a lot of Aishwarya and opulence. So because of the opulence of Dwarka, because of the Aishwarya, there's no, there's not the same sweetness. The more you have opulence, the less you have sweetness. You know, the people who live in the big city, they may have opulence, but they don't enjoy the, the sweetness of the people who live in the countryside. And the people in Vrindavan, they enjoy this madhurya. They enjoy that sweetness. They don't have this the same opulence as like in Dwarka. Of course, they have opulence, but it, it's it's they're not in that mood. Yes, okay, much. In, in, in Vrindavan, all the dust is touchstone, Chintamani, and all the trees are Kalpabriksha, and all the cows are Kamadenu cows. But the devotees there in Vrindavan are so pure that although the trees are Kalpabriksha, they only want flowers and fruit to worship Krishna. And they only want milk to cook for Krishna. They don't want, to, they don't want anything for their own sense gratification. They don't, they're not attracted by the opulence. They're happy in their natural environment in, the, in Vrindavan. And they enjoy the sweetness of that mood of Vrindavan. But the people in Dwarka, they have a different nature. So Prabhupada describes them as being unfortunate due to their misfortune. Hmm? You know, somebody's, somebody's fortunate to be, <laughs> somebody's fortunate to be in Madhurya Rasa, and somebody's, you could say they're unfortunate to be in Sakya Rasa. You may see it in a different way, but they're still still devotees. Okay, so Maharaj, uh, what I understand is like they were unfortunate because uh, they were not having that much love as the Navarvasis. Right. And, uh, and in verse like uh, Udham says, like they are unfortunate because they cannot identify Lord as personality of Godhead. So yeah. Both things are there, Maharaj. Or? Yes. Yeah, they're unfortunate that they, they don't have the, the same kind of intensity of prema which the people in Vrindavan have. And they were also unfortunate because they couldn't identify Krishna's personality of Godhead also. Yeah, they it described, they know him as a super soul. They know him as a super soul. That was mentioned. And Maharaj, just one more question, that when Krishna was there, so he was, all, like, he was, he was in his personal form, uh, 
uh, and when he left, he left his uh, like Maya Krishna, some body, like Maya Krishna. Yes, he leaves another. He leaves another a Maya body, and so that you know, it's a dead a dead body, and people, oh, this is Krishna, and then they cremate Krishna, and then they put his ashes there. This is the ashes of Krishna. It wasn't Krishna, you know. Devotees are not bewildered by these things because the devotee knows Lord Krishna has a spiritual body. His body doesn't die. Even you get you get an arrow in your foot, you're going to die. It's un <laughs> it's just it's, it's a whole past. It's so strange. But you know, some people are so atheistic. They have such a limited understanding. They think Krishna has a material body. They think Krishna is an ordinary person who takes birth and dies. They don't understand his transcendental nature and supreme dominion over everything. So these people, and, and this is very common, very common understanding. Many people will say, this. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, Krishna's ashes are there, we saw Krishna's ashes. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, I have two questions. Um, first is regarding this. Uh, uh, we see in the 11th chapter of First Canto that how Dwarkavasis are welcoming Lord Sri Krishna and they are feeling they were feeling great separation because Lord was away for a long time. So can we stay like this that just like Rajvasis were under Yoga Maya, same with Dwarkavasis were also not aware of Lord's glories because they were also under Yoga Maya put by the Lord. Like, is it wrong to say this is my first question? Oh yes, I I, I think that's right. I think the Dwarkavasis, there's also some Yoga Maya there. Yes. Okay. So, and my second question is uh, in one day of Brahma, which is uh, four thousand three hundred million years. So when Krishna comes. Uh, in one day of Brahma, we know. So, is it that all universes he will visit in that for uh, for like thirty thousand million years? Like every universe he covers, and then uh, in the second day of Brahma, again all the universes like that only it happens. Well, every universe. he visits different universes, right? There's so many universes, uh, so he he's going to visit whatever pastime is taking place in one universe. There will be a different pastime going on in another universe. Just like Prabhupada said, Krishna is speaking Bhagavad Gita right now in some other universe. And Arjuna is with him. So all these pastimes are going on eternally. Yeah, and they're going on each universe. The Lord comes in each universe. So in this time period, all universes are covered every time, every day of time. It would appear, yeah, we would understand like that. If, of course, how many universes, there's supposed to be an infinite number of universes. But 4,300 million years and the Lord's pastime, how long was the Lord manifest here? You know, 100, 125 years, that was his whole life. But he only performed one, each pastime, one pastime is there, when that pastime is finished, then that pastime takes place in another place. Right? The, the Lord takes his birth, okay, that pastime is finished, and then, then the birth pastime will take place in another universe. And then the Lord's growing up, and the Lord's growing up at a certain point, and then that, when that pastime is completed, then that pastime will go to another universe. Yes. So Maharaj, is, is it like that when a whole, like Lord winds up his whole Leela, then when he goes to another universe, again pastimes of birth and everything, or when birth pastime is over here, parallelly uh, another pastime on another planet is happening? Yeah, that's the way it's explained here. Srila Prabhupada is explaining it like that here to us. <laughs> that all of these pastimes are going on eternally. Thank you, Maharaj, for explaining about Krishna's Tattva Thank you. Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, I had a small query uh, like, regarding the same thing that we were discussing, that like Uddhava was considering uh, Dwaraka, like those were unfortunate. Is it the same case in uh, spiritual world also? Like in spiritual world, Dwaraka 
area, those are there. So they are also considered to be unfortunate or they are like liberated souls. They are not unfortunate. Rather, they are uh, situated in their uh, natural way of serving the Lord and they are satisfied with it. Yes, well, we can read in Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, we read a, about Gop Kumar, how he's traveling to these different places. And he comes to Vaikuntha, and then from Vaikuntha, then he goes to Dwarka, and he meets the people in Dwarka, and of course, the people in Dwarka, you know, they're happy, but they, they hear in Dwarka, Gop Kumar hears that there's another place, which is a very special place, which is far away from Dwarka, which is actually Goloka. And sometimes the Lord of Vaikuntha, that he will also disappear where, and he will go to visit that place. So generally the people who are there in Dwarka they're there, they're happy there. That's their, their particular mood. The nature of Ras is that you, you consider your own particular Rasa to be the highest. That even though you may not be in the mood of the gopis or like that, and Madhurya Ras, that the mood which they have there in Dwarka, which is generally, it's more Dasha Ras, with a, maybe a little bit of Sakya Ras, like Uddhava, Sakiras, but not on the level of the Kaur boys. And they're happy with that. They consider that to be the highest rasa. But if you're like Gop Kumar came there, and now he was of a different nature. So he came to Dwarka, he wasn't happy there. He didn't feel comfortable there. He wanted to go higher. He wanted to go to Goloka. So it depends on every individual. What is their particular nature? You see, people who are in Vaikuntha, they're happy, they're, they will feel satisfied there, but if that is their rasa. So everyone has their particular nature, and when we find our own nature, then we will feel happy there, and we will consider that to be the best. Can you understand, Prabhu? Oh, yes, Maharaj, it was very clear. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, just one question. Uh, we, we know that Prabhupada is Ditya Siddha, but how do we understand the uh, activity of Prabhupada being involved in uh, nationalism, of being you know, engaged in fighting Maharaj? Yes. How do we understand Prabhupada that he was a follower of Gandhi? Or, uh, promoting nationalism, independence of India. You could say, just like Sukadeva Goswami was an impersonalist, he was fixed on the Brahma Jyoti, but he became attracted by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. So you can say that Prabhupada being a nationalist, this was also Leela, to show the power of the pure devotee and the power of Lord Krishna and the attraction of devotional service. That when Prabhupada heard Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, that he was, he could understand this is true. What he's preaching is actually the truth. It's the highest thing. So Prabhupada was convinced. Thank you, Maharaj. Very amazing example of Sukadeva Goswami. One more question, Maharaj. Uh, that uh, usually we see now uh, when we are uh, in, at present, say, you know, even in my youth, when we get affected by disease and uh, you know, uh, problems, uh, it becomes very difficult in the state to remember uh, Krishna. Uh, but how do we uh, practice Krishna consciousness in such a way? Because in the old age, uh, the amount of disease. And the body, you know, it's this one. So how do we develop or how do we practice Krishna consciousness in such a way that uh, we can remember Krishna even, you know, uh, bodily uh, problems and old age is affecting us in the old age? Because service attitude keeps on increasing. It was being mentioned in Uttavas particular. Yes, well, obviously that 
the type of service which we do in the older age will be different from the type of service which we performed in our youth. You know, as in our youth we would do a lot of active physical service, chanting and dancing, book distribution and so on. But in older age, you know, in the, the body age, you're not quite able to do those kind of things the same. But certainly there's service to be done. We, find, we have to find the services which we can do. We saw the nice example, the one devotee, Vibhu Chaitanya Prabhu, who lived in Vrindavan. Now when the Vrindavan temple opened, he came there and he became the cook. And he used to cook every offering. He would cook every offering for the deities and he'd spend the whole day in the kitchen cooking and he chanted all his rounds as he was cooking and Prabhupada proved it. But then in his old age his got, body got weaker and weaker, he became invalid, he couldn't do the cooking. This, so what he did, he took up and he would sit and he would give Charanamrita and he would give, put a drop of Charanamrita in people's hands and then he would pour water and wash their hand and wipe their hand with great devotion. Yeah, so he took on, on a different service and he did like that up until he left the body. So the, the idea is, you know, you find some other, you cannot do the service the same way with what you did in your youth, but you find some other kinds of service to do. We have to use our intelligence and ingenuity to find out what can we do. Definitely there's things to be done and we definitely do want to increase our hearing and chanting. So sometimes people, they, they're so helpless, they can't do anything else but hear and chant. So simply absorb themselves in that at the end of life, hearing and chanting. And some people, they they, they take, they do writing, they like to write later on in older age, you write some books. In the, in the beginning, you know, you, we have to read. As young people, you don't have much knowledge and much experience, but we read and study and everything. Then later on in life, you have more knowledge, you can write more, you, you can give uh, the benefits of your learning and your realizations in writing books. I think the Goswamis, they did like that, you know, they came there in their older age, they were writing, they, they had younger people, people who came there were young like Gopal Bhatta, he was a Sanskrit scholar so he could edit. Those younger people who are well educated, they would do the editing, the older people would write, these kind of things. So everything according to time, place and circumstances. What can we do for Krishna? Certainly we can do something, we have to find something. And so hearing, chanting, sometimes people make flower garlands and some people uh, help to cut the vegetables. Do something, find something to do, fold samosas, roll sweet balls. <laughs> Certainly where there's a will, there's a way. We, will, we can find some kind of service to keep ourselves absorbed. Yes? Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes? Any other question? Okay, so then we will stop here today and we will we'll meet you all again on Friday morning. We'll continue this chapter. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Go back to Vrindaki. Yeah.